Welcome to the KEI's Networks series, exploring decarbonization, reducing GHG emissions to arrest climate change. The focus in this, the second episode, is about the role of technologies, current and emerging, to address climate change. Episode one explored the energy economy, the complex relationship between energy, fueling economies around the globe with residual environmental emissions discussed were the role of innovation and various socio-political options for containing climate change. Let me be more specific. Our troubled climate is the victim of an imbalance in energy emissions. An energy transition is called for, warranting, for example, penalty pricing for producing and using carbon for energy, or another option is adoption of environmentally benign sources of energy. And we think of wind, solar, geothermal, et cetera, and or learning to adapt to the anticipated increase in global warming. Today, we expect to learn more about mankind's capacity through technology to contain and maybe even reverse the ever-increasing GHG emissions warming the planet. Our moderator for the webinar is Eddie Isaacs. Over to you, Eddie. Well, thanks very much, uh, Perry, and uh, kudos for the job you're doing in organizing this, this series of uh, webinars. Uh, at the webinar of December 2nd, the speakers and Eric Newell, the moderator, all agreed that the likelihood that we will meet uh, net zero conditions by 2050, uh, both globally and in Canada, is very dubious. To achieve net zero, according to the IPCC, will require reductions in GHG emissions of over 45% by 2030, and over 90% by 2050. Uh, this is compared to our current emissions. And um, I think we can agree that this is gonna be a very, very difficult task. Well, the scientists blame the politicians. The science says that we have a climate emergency and you politicians are not doing enough. The politicians say it's not us. The science says that we have a climate, uh, the, it's the fossil fuel company, sorry for that. They know about global warming and knew about it decades ago and they continued with business as usual. The fossil fuel companies say it's not us. After all, it's a consumption problem. The world needs our oil and gas products. Climate lawsuits are also surging with the legal system blaming governments for failure to protect the climate for future generation and forcing governments to include more ambitious CO2 emission reduction targets. Examples of this are occurring as we speak in Germany and Holland. But even the queen got into the blame game and has been heard to say in an open mic it is really irritating when they talk, but they don't do. I think she was referring here to the politicians. But we have seen the politicians act very decisively in COVID, on the COVID-19 emergency when it was very clear that the antidote to the virus are vaccines and vaccinations. Politicians in most countries were remarkable in making vaccines available and urging vaccination on their people. It is an overall uh, impressive performance. By contrast, the directions to take in dealing with climate change is fuzzy, emotion, emotional, and in many cases, illogical. So it's not surprising that politicians are making commitments that are politically motivated, but bad in terms of meeting targets. Some say the antidote to the climate emergency is technology and innovation. Unfortunately, it is not that simple and there is total confusion and on how we should act. Solar and wind uh, are now cheaper than fossil fuels, but they are intermittent and by themselves can't substitute fossil fuels. So what about CCUS? The cost, logistics, and energy requirements of CCUS are obstacles for the number of projects we need to bring online. Uh, Shell talks about 10,000 uh, CCUS projects by 2050, 
And that's going to be a big number to uh, try to make a difference. How about hydrogen, green or blue? Green is expensive and needs lots of extra low carbon energy, which we don't have at a large scale. Blue also needs extra energy for the CCS portion and clean source of natural gas. Both green and blue hydrogen don't have ready-made markets. So, you know, that's gonna take time. It's gonna happen. Uh, then let's jump on biomass and biofuels as substitute for fossil fuels for power and transportation. We should not forget that biomass and biofuels emit CO2 that stayed in the atmosphere for decades, and they're certainly not the answer. We're uh, in the West, at least, shutting nuclear plants in many places. Instead, we are now betting on SMRs. Indeed, there are many designs for SMRs, but as yet none operating commercially. And then, if all of that together is not enough, we'll plant a billion trees or more. The point I'm trying to make is, is that it's a complex and confusing situation with no silver bullet and no easy solutions. It doesn't help to blame politicians or anyone else for that matter, especially when whatever action is taken has both unintended and intended consequences for our economy and our well being. For my, from my perspective, technology and innovation is essential and will have an important role to play, but at the scale and the long lead time required for deployment, the extra energy for deployment, here I'm thinking of CCUS, hydrogen, and direct air capture as examples, and the enormous economic cost for deployment, the best we can hope for is technology innovation will help slow the rate of global warming so as um, Perry pointed out, we can adapt to a warmer world in a more predictable and less frantic fashion. This webinar is about emerging technologies to address climate change. We have three distinguished experts to address the technology topic. Dr. Oscar Sigvalton, Sigvaldson, Dr. Axel Meissen, and Dr. Mark Summers. They'll unravel the mysteries behind the current energy system and what the energy system will look like as the transition progresses. They will introduce the key emerging technologies and the time frame that they can start to make a difference. And finally, the, the remarkable innovative projects that are happening in Alberta and how Alberta can and is playing a leadership technology role in Canada. I'll uh, introduce each speaker just, just before they make their presentation. And our first speaker is Oscar Sigvaldson. Oscar is the former president of Acres International Global Consulting Engineering and Management Services Company. And Oscar has provided continuing leadership in the applications of system analysis methods for decision support in deriving optimal solution for complex problems. And uh, in this regard, his work on the Chauchia Energy Futures Project is legendary. He's president of CSCMS Global and a member of the Future Engineering Committee for the Canadian Academy of Engineering. Uh, Oscar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eddie, for your introductory comment. That sets a very important uh, foundation for uh, the three presentations. And also, I wanted to thank you, uh, Perry, for organizing the series of webinars on decarbonization. You are certainly to be congratulated on your very timely organizing for this very important series of webinars, which occurs right after the recent COP26 meetings in Glasgow. I'm very honored to be invited to participate in this, the second of the three webinars on decarbonization in Alberta perspective. This will build from the first webinar, which focused on global energy economy. For this opening presentation, I have 10 PowerPoints. I begin with a brief discussion on net zero and what does it mean. From this, 
The focus moves to mitigation and how this impacts on the transformation of Canada's energy sector, which of course is dominated by the by its hydrocarbon sector. I will then briefly review the transformation of end uses and associated technologies. Finally, I will provide perspectives on how real progress can be achieved in responding to the climate change challenge. This includes both initiatives in Alberta as well as working with jurisdictions across Canada on overcoming Canada's major challenges in relation to the net zero uh, goal. <clears throat> I begin with a slide on net zero. This is the stated goal that's all embodied in many climate change agreements, including COP26. Mathematically, net zero occurs when the rate of GHG emissions equals the rate of absorption of GHG, dominantly CO2 from the atmosphere. When we, when we examine absorption from the atmosphere, the options are very few and associated rates are very slow. Uh, even with Canada having 9% of the world's forests, the rate of potential absorption with afforestation and reforestation, improved forest management, and other options for Canada's forest sector result in rates that are very small in relation to rates of emission from Canada's many other sectors, many of which are very energy intensive. There's been a lot of attention given to the bioenergy with CCS option, which Eddie referred to, BEX, especially by IPCC. However, this has often has been shown in various Canadian studies to be limited um, by limitations on feedstock availability. There are also major questions, as Eddie uh, noted very well, about this option uh, that burning biomass for energy production is not emissions neutral. Emissions are immediate while corresponding absorption from the atmosphere with tree regrowth occur many years later. There are also studies of direct air capture, such as the Canadian Initiative by Carbon Engineering or the CARPIC project in Iceland. The CARPIC project converts captured CO2 into a carbonate rock by injecting uh, captured CO2 into high temperature basaltic formations. To date, such initiatives are either very energy, very energy intensive or lack scale in relation to the magnitude of GHG emissions in general. The key message, as shown at the bottom of the slide, is that the potential for GHG absorption from the atmosphere is very limited based on what we know today. The conclusion is that we cannot rely on any significant contribution to absorption strategies from the atmosphere. Accordingly, there need to be major commitment to reducing emissions wherever possible. The next PowerPoint has a lot of information on it, which um, so I will focus on the highlights. The pair of pie charts in the upper right quadrant is a reasonably standard way of showing GHG emissions. This is for all of Canada for 2019. Left diagram includes all emissions, which are approximately 720 million tons of CO2 equivalent. Roughly 75% is combustion emissions, which is shown on the left pie chart. And then the breakout pie chart on the right is non-combustion emissions, which is about 25% of the total. The non-combustion emissions include industrial emissions, which are byproducts of chemical processes, fugitive emissions, which is primarily leakage of methane, Agriculture emissions, primarily methane from ruminant animals and nitrous oxides from nitrogen-based fertilizers, and landfill emissions, which again is primarily methane. Combustion emissions are in two parts, supply and demand. Roughly two-thirds of combustion emissions occur with needing energy end uses in the transportation, industrial, residential, commercial, and agricultural sectors. This is shown in the lower and left, lower left portions of the left diagram in the upper right quadrant. The, uh, <clears throat> the lower left pair of pie charts are identical to the pair in the upper right quadrant on the PowerPoint, except for one key point. When we analyze emissions from end uses, 
These are for two purposes only, motive power and thermal energy. Motive power is provided by internal combustion engines dominantly for the transportation sector, but also includes uh, energy for, uh, for compressors, drills, pumps, and industrial drives. Thermal energy is required for space heating in buildings and for high temperature applications in industry. So this allows us then to begin to focus on these two end uses, which are the motive power and the thermal energy. <clears throat> so the key observation is that total about 50% of total emissions are combustion emissions from burning hydrocarbons for meeting these two types of uh, emissions. In order to meet the net zero goal, the first challenge is to examine options for essentially eliminating such emissions or satisfying such end users. As noted in Eric Newell's opening comments in the previous webinar, this serves as a very basic recognition of what the end goal looks like and focus on the defining transformation strategies from transitioning to a goal with essentially total elimination of burning hydrocarbons to satisfying end uses. In the next four PowerPoints, I will highlight the options and perspectives, including technology options, for replacing use of hydrocarbons with emissions-free solutions that meet end use demands. For meeting motive power demands, the dominant cost effective options are electricity and hydrogen. Electricity for cars, light, and medium duty vehicles, as well as for urban and interurban public transportation, and for short range marine transport. For heavy duty truck and rail transport, battery technology is not sufficiently advanced for electricity to be a competitive option. So the more likely option is based on hydrogen fuel cell technology. There's also a potential role for nuclear for long range marine transport. Um, this is international across the Pacific and the Atlantic and so on because of the refueling advantage. There's already a proven technology. This is also a proven technology for submarines. One of the very challenging problems uh, for a cost effect is a cost effective solution to air transport. So this may still need to rely on the hydrocarbon sector for production uh, of competitively priced jet fuels. One of the very interesting aspects about using electricity for motive power is the greatly increased conversion of electric motors relative to internal combustion engines. Electric motors have conversion efficiencies which are over 90% compared to internal combustion engines, which are generally around 25%. This interesting result is that it translates into conversion to electric actually um, represent, being represented as an overall significant reduction in the need for primary energy supply. For meeting thermal energy demands for buildings and industry when replacing use of hydrocarbons, the dominant options again are electricity and hydrogen. The first step is always to assess the potential for energy efficiency and energy transportation, uh, trans conservation, as noted. We also look at uh, um, biomass and forest residues and landfill gas from, from waste uh, sites. However, um, those quickly become resource constrained. So the major challenge with this option is cost, including the real um, um, standard investment burning natural gas pipeline distribution infrastructure. In several European countries, sorry, uh, what I was getting to there is that uh, the, high, the option of actually using hydrogen as 100% in existing pipeline and distribution systems is a challenge because there are some technical issues such as uh, combustibility, um, corrosion, and uh, leakage. However, this is an option that is being 
looked at in several European countries, particularly Germany, Netherlands, and the UK, and uh, is the idea of converting existing natural gas infrastructure to uh, transporting 100% hydrogen. So uh, for the for the industrial side, the hydrogen option also interesting for high temperature applications, including its competitiveness with electric arc furnaces for high temperature industrial processes. In the next two PowerPoints, the focus is on the supply challenge with producing emissions-free um, uh, production of electricity and hydrogen, respectively. The transformation process towards net zero will certainly result in a major increase in electricity demand and associated supply. Projections are typically two to three fold. For Canada, this means that electricity supply will need to increase from its current 650 terawatt hours per annum to as much as 2,000 terawatt hours in 2050. Generating capacity will need to increase from its current 130 megawatts to more than 500 megawatts. This is in addition to the need for upgrading and rehabilitating existing uh, capacity and for phasing out coal-fired generation. There are also demands for emissions-free electricity from intermittent generating sources and for major increases in storage, especially pump storage for long-duration storage. I would note that potentially important uh, role of uh, natural gas co combined cycle generation with CCS. Um, we have I've been involved in a recent study with Hatch to look at this option. And uh, this looks like a very promising option, especially when um, nuclear and hydro are either not available or not acceptable. So as noted, um, um, also I want to emphasize the potentially important role of nuclear uh, for future electricity supply. And Alex uh, will certainly be presenting this in more detail, including the potential for both fission and fusion energy. As a final note here, there are potential complementarities between electricity and hydrogen in terms of both energy exchange and for storage. This next PowerPoint addresses the challenge with uh, production and delivery of emissions-free hydrogen. As noted, the main sources of hydrogen include production by electrolysis and by reforming of hydrocarbons, dominantly by hydrocarbons and dominantly natural gas. At present, 96% of hydrogen produced globally is by reforming, 4% by, um, by electrolysis. The, uh, the cost of uh, electrolysis is about two and a half times higher than the production from uh, reforming. As noted, um, hydrogen can in fact be produced by many different technologies. Um, the traditional production of hydrogen has been by steam methane reforming, but that produces a lot of CO2, which needs to be sequestered. So there are other options now uh, in which uh, natural gas is the feedstock, but the amount of CO2 is uh, greatly reduced. There are also options where um, options with regard to uh, based on uh, no CO2 being produced, uh, in particular the um, the uh, plasma reforming, but uh, on the work that I have been familiar with to date, uh, it is not competitive with uh, electrolysis. So this then brings me to the last two PowerPoints, um, which really addresses the, uh, the, the challenges and opportunities for Alberta to assume a strong leadership role in addressing the challenge of reducing CAT emissions, while also ensuring economic growth and orderly transformation of energy systems. This ties in um, with the challenge as articulated by uh, Perry in his opening remarks and on the opportunities for Alberta. So Alberta has a very enviable tradition of being a global leader in addressing the enormous economic and technical challenges associated with achieving progress on its energy sector and challenges. This has been achieved uh, over the last 50 years 
um, and in which technology has played a very important role in ensuring that uh, Alberta is a major supplier of uh, hydrocarbons uh, for Canada and for export to the rest of the world. Um, it has excellent universities and colleges, research institutions, policy institutes. Um, and now Alberta is again faced with another opportunity of transforming its energy sector to the needs of the people in Alberta and across Canada. In this PowerPoint, I try to emphasize the importance of moving from its established strength to also strengthening the overall approach and process, um, which includes comprehensive integrated planning, uh, giving greater attention to decision processes, and uh, finding a way of bringing together political leaders, uh, industry leaders, and government and other key stakeholders working together in terms of defining the um, the optimal set of solutions, the optimal pathways, with a very clear idea of what the end goal is. Just a few little bullets here. Um, the decision process requires cooperation. It should be nonpartisan, and um, when we look at technology options, there has to be respect for the fact that these need to be fully engineered. It needs to be underpinned by clear scientific understanding, and it needs to be realistically scheduled in terms of uh, all the phases from research and development to demonstration and commercialization. For my final PowerPoint, I also refer to the importance of national leadership on the most important national priorities that are impeding progress and must be overcome if we have any realistic expectation of achieving net zero within a reasonable time period. The first of these is to work towards a clear and shared Canadian story on the importance of Canada's hydrocarbon sector for economic growth and development for Canada, while much of the national while much of national dialogue is to equate net zero with eliminating hydrocarbons in their, in their entirety, this is simply a grossly incorrect messaging about the importance of Canada's hydrocarbon sector. While there will be a major reduced role for direct combustion from heating end uses, there is a potentially very large emerging role in which hydrocarbons become the dominant feedstock for hydrogen production and as a source for electricity generation with CCS or CCUS. This is in addition to its established role as a feedstock for production of various hydrocarbon products, including plastics, polymers, and various medical um, products. It is also important that Canada's export potential not be impeded as there is a huge global market for hydrocarbon, uh, even as the even as the world works toward a net zero goal. The second major issue is related to overcoming the regulatory constraints that are impeding infrastructure development in Canada. Without major change in the supporting regulatory framework, it's difficult to see how Canada can deliver on the huge infrastructure requirements uh, required to reach net zero. As noted above, this includes enormous investment in electricity supply and rehabilitation, uh, support for a hydrogen-based economy, and the infrastructure transition for the hydrocarbon, for Canada's hydrocarbon sector. The third priority is the need to rebuild Canada's capacity for the engineering and delivery of major infrastructure. This is a globally recognized capability that existed in Canada 50 years ago but to a significant extent has disappeared with the absence of large infrastructure development in Canada. This needs to be rebuilt if we're going to be successful in delivering the large infrastructure which is required over in the process of reaching net zero. So in the spirit of ending on a positive note, I'm confident that Canada can greatly improve its performance in delivering major reductions in GHG emissions in achieving economic growth and having a globally competitive hydrocarbon sector. This will not be easy and will require more and better coordination between political leaders, government, industry, and other key stakeholders. 
there will be major changes in our energy system and the way in which we use energy to meet our everyday needs. There will be extra cost burden for society, but if we do this in an organized way, this should be manageable. So thank you again for the opportunity of making this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Oscar. This was a great, insightful presentation on the energy system, how it will evolve in the transition, what are the key technologies to decarbonize the end use sector, such as transportation, electricity, industry, and uh, buildings. And I, I think your note about um, how Alberta can take a leadership role is really well taken, um, including the point about the, the infrastructure we're missing. And if we are not going to pursue that uh, kind of infrastructure, it's going to be to our detriment and it's gonna make it much harder to reach our goals. So thank you very much, Oscar, well done. The next presentation is on uh, insights into nuclear fission and fusion. And our speaker is Dr. Axel Meissen. He's the president of the Fusion Energy Council of Canada. He's the former inaugural chair in foresight of the Alberta Research Council. Axel is also a former president of Memorial University of Newfoundland and president of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. He was also, he's also the former Dean of Applied Science and Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of British Columbia. He was appointed to the Order of Canada in 2008. Uh, welcome, Axel. Thank you very much, uh, Eddie. And also thank you, Perry, for your thoughtful introductions. Much appreciated. And thank you for mounting this set of three webinars. I will now take you into a specialized area, the world of nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Both nuclear fission and fusion can be expected to make important new contributions to, the, to decarbonization, but only in the longer term. However, my objective is not to convince you what these two for energy forums can do or cannot do. My objective here today is to provide you with some fundamentals and some insights so that you can judge for yourself. Let me start with a background slide that complements what uh, Oscar has already stated. This slide comes from the IAE and shows the world energy supply to the year 2040. It indicates that the energy supply will increase and has to increase but the portion of nuclear will not, is not expected to increase very much. The nuclear portion is shown in yellow. Beyond 2040, the picture may change, demonstrating the long lead times for nuclear plants and technologies. Let me now turn to the fact that, that nuclear fission and fusion are both natural phenomena. In fission's case, it has occurred and is occurring inside the Earth. And in fusion's case, it is occurring, as we speak, in the sun and all of the stars. In this slide, I will show you the basic fission and fusion reactions. That is, the reactions that involve atomic nuclei, as opposed to chemical reactions, which typically involve the electrons that surround the nuclei. On the left-hand side is diametrically shown a, uh, a neutron interacting with the uranium uh, nucleus, uh, which gets split. First of all, it gets transformed into U-236, and then it splits into barium and krypton, and there are various subsequent reactions. It produces several neutrons, which in turn then can impinge on U-235, thereby sustaining the reaction, and it produces energy. Fission involves large nuclei. Fusion, by comparison, typically involves small nuclei. And the diagram on the right-hand side shows the interaction between the nuclei of deuterium and tritium uh, that forms, that combine temporarily, ejecting a neutron and forming helium and also releasing energy. 
The really important thing to note is that as these changes in the nuclei occur, there is a change in mass, and that mass is converted into energy. According to Einstein's equation, E is equal to mc squared, the release of energy is very, very substantial for a small amount of mass change. So if we represent the just the fusion uh, reactions here, uh, the first reaction shows deuterium denoted as uh, 2H uh, fusing or reacting with uh, tritium denoted by 3H and it forms helium and a neutron and it releases 17.5 mega uh, electron volts. Now the neutron can be made to interact with lithium but thereby forming more helium and producing tritium once again that can be used. So the overall reaction is in effect uh, deuterium with lithium giving helium and releasing 22.3 mega electron volts of energy. Translating uh, electron volts, which is uh, an energy unit well known among physicists, but less so amongst engineers uh, and even some chemists. So translating it into somewhat different numbers, but that are equivalent. Uh, we arrive at the conclusion that ideally one kilogram of, of, of deuterium requires five kilograms of heavy water and three kilograms of lithium, and it would yield, it would yield 300,000 megawatt hours of energy, which would be equivalent to 135,000 barrels of petroleum. If you look at it in the other way around, again, this is our overall reaction, one million barrels of petroleum, uh, which uh, have an energy equivalent upon combustion, of 2.2 terawatt hours of energy, that could be produced from 7.5 kilograms of deuterium uh, combining with 22 kilograms of lithium. So you see the enormous difference in mass because in one case, fission and fusion, it involves atomic nuclei as opposed to the electrons that surround the atomic nuclei. So let me say a few words about uh, fission. And you probably have uh, heard the announcement of General Electric and Hitachi TEH having been awarded uh, by OPG uh, the contract to build a small modular reactor at Darlington in Ontario. This would be a boiling water uh, reactor uh, slated to produce 300 megawatts of electricity. Uh, site preparation is expected to start next year with the startup of the facility towards the end of the, uh, of the decade. It would uh, result in significant uh, CO2 emission avoidance. A few words about the appearance of, of this facility. On the left hand side are shown two different pictures. They seem to show different uh, plants. <laughs> they are both from GEH uh, sources. And I'm not sure which one will ultimately materialize. One of the things that we notice is the absence of the typical cooling towers that we are uh, associating with nuclear plants. But if one actually looks inside uh, the reactor uh, system, uh, we are looking at a single unit about 27 meters in height and, and several meters in diameter, which is buried below the surface of the ground, it's located below the surface of the ground. One might wonder why that is so. Uh, the answer is not entirely clear, but the early considerations of all nuclear, modern nuclear SMRs has revolved around the potential uh, terrorist attacks. So if you put the plant below ground or the reactors below ground, uh, that is safer from that uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. This is a new scale uh, reactor. Uh, which is a reactor system that contains several modules combined into a, a plant. It's an integrated pressurized water reactor uh, with each one of the units producing of the order of 45 uh, megawatt electricity. And uh, this particular configura configuration is desirable 
uh, if you want to have high steam quality, that is high steam, high pressure, high temperature steam at a high flow rate of the kind that you would want for SAGD applications in Alberta. Uh, this particular slide comes from a report that uh, was done under the auspices of Alberta Innovates Technology Futures some years ago, and I'll give you the reference to it. So here we have a situation of several uh, reactor modules being present in parallel in one unit. I've emphasized the SMRs because they are currently uh, very much the focus of attention, and I'm going to raise some questions about them later on. Now, switching over to fusion compared uh, in contrast with fission. So what are the scientific and engineering challenges that first of all have to be addressed? Well, as we all know, the atomic nuclei are positively charged. And if you want to fuse them, you have to bring them together. Now, how to bring them together? Uh, there are different possibilities. But one way of doing it is to raise the temperature very, very significantly to a million plus degrees and to increase the pressure. Now, when you do that, then uh, the atoms uh, form a plasma, that is the nuclei and the electrons are separate and moving freely. At very high pressures and very high temperatures, the, uh, the nuclei as well as the electrons move very rapidly. And as you can imagine, when they move very rapidly and bounce and, and impact on each other, they may overcome their repulsive forces. And that's exactly what happens in the sun. Now, to maintain uh, the, uh, the, the fusion reactions either requires having a continuing burning plasma or creating a plasma repeatedly. And that's done in two basic approaches. So one form of containing a plasma at elevated uh, temperatures 100 million degrees or thereabouts, and elevated pressures is by means of magnetic confinement. And this is uh, the approach taken uh, by many uh, technologies, including the international uh, development, which is called the ETA development in southern France. It's a plant that is under construction to demonstrate the science of nuclear fusion it's not intended as a facility that produces electricity continuously, but as a key stepping stone towards a demonstration plant and then a commercial plant that, uh, that utilizes uh, the fusion phenomenon. A different approach from the magnetic confinement is called inertial confinement, where uh, you start out with a pellet uh, consisting of uh, uh, frozen deuterium and tritium, and you impinge a series of lasers, high-powered lasers, approximately 200, onto the surface of this small pellet, just a few millimeters in diameter. What happens as a result of the laser energy that is conveyed to the surface, the surface of this pellet heats up very rapidly, uh, a significant portion uh, evaporates, and as it evaporates by Newton's laws or by the rocket effect, the compression occurs. And if the compression is sufficiently rapid, sufficiently high, and sufficiently geometrically smooth so that there is in fact concentric compression, uh, you arrive at fusion, which produces uh, heat, helium, and neutrons. So this uh, insert of images shows the laser bay on the left-hand side, the, uh, the chamber where the uh, inertial compression takes place uh, in the center, and on the right-hand side, it's difficult to see, is this tiny little uh, pellet uh, located in this big sphere and uh, the laser beams are in, impacting uh, on that laser, uh, on that uh, fuel pellet. Now, a lot of work is going on 
and it's accelerating worldwide in the fusion area. At present, there's over 130 sites with two sites in Canada where fusion work is being done. But the most active sites are in the United States, Europe, and, and in the Far East, uh, China and, and Japan. Very interestingly, the private sector is stepping up with investments. You recall me mentioning the ITER facility. It's a uh, uh, $30 billion multinational initiative. But just over the last uh, several months, several billion dollars of private sector investment have gone into the development of fusion development, principally in the United States and in Western Europe. We can deduce from that that there is a sense that fusion is closer than uh, it used to be thought about and that commercialization uh, is probably not that far away, but we're still talking in terms of real major commercialization decades, not years. In this slide, it's a busy table. I, I've tried to summarize uh, and compare uh, fission and fusion uh, in accordance with a number of criteria. Uh, in the case of fission, the basic science is established. Uh, the basic technology is established. We know the raw materials. We know that uh, fission reactors are complex. We now have uh, the advent of smaller fission reactors, so-called modular reactors. Uh, there are some comments about safety, uh, the inherent safety of fission reactors, I would categorize as modest, but the actual performance is actually good to excellent, although there have been some near misses. Uh, a key issue is uh, the radioactivity of the uh, fission products, which have tend to have very long half-lives measured in uh, centuries, in some cases, uh, millennia. Uh, carbon emissions are low to none in terms of their operation. Carbon emissions do occur during construction and will occur during decommissioning. Uh, the capital costs of fission are high. Uh, which contributes to the overall high cost. And public opinion on fission is, to put it mildly, polarized. Uh, and, and that's never a good, 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 good thing. In the case of fusion, you see what I, uh, the, the corresponding responses to, uh, to these criteria. Uh, the basic technology still needs to be proven. Uh, the complexity of fusion plants is exceedingly high at present, but I think that will really change. Uh, they do have the benefit of high, high inherent safety and actual uh, safety, but the costs, both capital and operating are still questionable. Although the, in the case of the United States, the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering have taken uh, a good stab at that and have specified at least uh, the objectives. Just a few high level comments uh, to remind us all. Uh, fission and fusion relevancy to Canada. Uh, these fission and fusion are large constant sources. Next click. Uh, it can be used, the electricity and the thermal uh, energy output can be used by electrification and uh, district and home and business heating. Next one, please. Uh, but then there are unconventional uses. Uh, one unconventional use would be extraction of, uh, of bitumen from the oil sands. Uh, and that has received attention. And as I mentioned to you before, we've done work on that at Alberta Innovates, and I'll give you the references uh, shortly. Uh, but then there is also the issue of conversion of oil and gas into different products, all of which are energy intensive. Uh, processes. And we've already heard about hydrogen production, which is also en energy intensive. And both fission and in the longer term, fusion can make a significant contribution. I think it would probably be self-evident that fission and fusion are new technologies, at least SMRs are new technologies, and with all the attendant benefits and challenges uh, that, they, uh, that they have uh, for new businesses and new employment. So let me conclude by posing a series of questions. I, I will not answer these questions, but I'd like, really like to uh, posit them with you. 
I don't think there is any real doubt that uh, the complexity of current fission and fusion technologies should be reduced. The question is how to do this. Uh, there's kind of an intriguing question of whether SMRs, whether a few SMRs are preferable to one larger fission reactor and what can weigh that. Uh, what are realistic timeframes for fission? For fission SMRs, I think the end of the decade is quite realistic. For fusion, it is not the end of this decade. It's probably uh, the end of the 2030s in terms of demonstration and uh, 2050 in terms of actual application. There's this very interesting question or set of questions is, is fission or are fission and fusion energy green, renewable and sustainable? And one can look at that in, in, in different ways. How do we manage radioactive wastes? How do we inform the public better so that the public can make better decisions about fission and particularly about fusion? Uh, I think the benefits of fission for major industrial sectors are reasonably clear. The benefits of fusion are not, reason, not yet clear. And it's really not yet clear what the long-term benefits are for the Alberta petroleum industry. But my thinking has led me to conclude that they are by and large strong benefits. In fact, essential benefits for the future of this industry. And then lastly, what should, uh, action should Canada take? For fission, we have taken the decision to invest in SMRs. Canada has no real presence as far as fusion is concerned. Although I'm very happy to say there are the beginnings. We now have the engagement with ITER. And I think that is very, very promising. And I'm also very pleased about the uh, support that our American friends uh, are providing us in the uh, fusion area. Here are some references uh, to reports that we've done on SMRs and SAGD and hydrogen production. Uh, there's a series of really good references on uh, fusion uh, by the National Academy of Sciences in the US and the IIEA. And the next one, uh, you may all be familiar with uh, references on SMRs in Canada, uh, the call to action, and now the rollout of the action plan. With that, I conclude my presentation and I thank you for the opportunity. And I acknowledge uh, that some of this material comes from other sources, including uh, Robert uh, Fodetseev at the University of Alberta, and as always, Alan Offenberger's input. Thank you. Very insightful, uh, very decisive, substantial presentation. Uh, describing the fundamentals of nuclear fission and fusion, uh, the insights on the challenges and opportunities, and the configuration designs of these reactors, and uh, how they can be deployed and when they will be deployed, um, as well as the um, uh, programs that are in place uh, to make them commercial, uh, including the, the worker Darlington. Uh, Mark Summers, the Chief uh, Strategy Officer for uh, Emissions Reduction Alberta, responsible for the development coordination and implementation of key strategic initiatives, partnerships, external relation, and stakeholder engagement that demonstrates and communicates ERA's unique value proposition. Uh, we've known Mark for quite a long time, and he has been spectacular in the way he has been able to move technologies uh, to through the stages of commercialization um, and the insights he provides is, uh, is will be superb, I'm sure. Thank you, Mark. Thanks again, Eddie, and thanks, Perry, for giving me the opportunity to participate in today's session. I must say it's an absolute honor to share the virtual stage with these highly accomplished and highly respected intellectual powerhouses. Uh, thanks both. Oscar and Axel for setting the stage so brilliantly and diving deep into the world of nuclear power. It's always a dual benefit when I can share a bit about what we're doing at ERA and I can learn a lot from my fellow panelists. So as Eddie mentioned, I'm Mark Summers. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Emissions Reduction Alberta or ERA. And what I'd like to do for a few minutes before we move into the panel discussion is share 
a handful of examples of technology innovation projects in the areas particularly that Oscar talked about as being critical for decarbonization. We, we don't, I will say, we don't actually have anything nuclear power related in our portfolio, either fusion or fission, but we're excited that these are indeed some opportunities and early activities in Alberta related to nuclear. And, and Axel, I'd be, in your acknowledgement slide, my first research term was with, in Bob Fedeseev's lab, and so it turns out it's a small world after all. So as some context for the examples I want to share and the message I'd like to share from ERA's perspective, I'll start by giving a brief introduction of who we are and, and what we do. Um, ERA is an organization based in the province of Alberta, and we were created by the government of Alberta to help the province achieve the dual purposes of achieving greenhouse gas emissions reductions and economic success. And now, as a quick aside, our our inaugural first board chair when we were created in 2009 was Eric Newell, who, uh, who moderated, as we know, part one of this discussion and is also on the line today. Uh, so we exist as, as an extension of Alberta's greenhouse gas reduction regulatory framework. In Alberta, large industrial emitters are required to reduce their emissions to a particular level. And one option to comply with that regulation is to pay money into what's now known as the tier fund. We end up at ERA receiving a portion of the revenue from the tier fund, and our mandate as an organization is to reduce emissions and support the economy by accelerating innovative technology solutions. Our role, in essence, is to share the risk of technology innovation with the private sector. So, oops. What is it that we do? We carry out that mandate by reinvesting the revenues we're provided with to projects that advance these innovative greenhouse gas reducing technologies toward commercialization in the province of Alberta. Our focus is at the latter stages of technology readiness level, you could see on the slide here. So we primarily fund technology field pilots or what you might call commercial demonstration projects and in some cases first of kind commercial deployments in Alberta. And some of the examples I'll talk about in a few minutes will represent each of these categories. Now, this model, the ERA model of using proceeds from a carbon pricing system and reinvesting a portion of those revenues into technology de-risking is ultimately a powerful one. It allows us to take a portfolio approach across industries and across timescales so we can help position our current industries as well as emerging industries to be competitive and sustainable in the future. So I'm just going to skip over this slide in the interest of time. And I, I, I also don't need to spend a lot of time on this because Oscar talked about this, well, primarily at the national level. But you can see here that Alberta's greenhouse gas profile is heavily industrial. We are an energy producing and an energy exporting jurisdiction. And, and that really comes to bear in both our greenhouse gas emissions as well as our economic productivity. So what this means is that there are some key areas we can focus on when it comes to reducing Alberta's existing greenhouse gas footprint. So the technology roadmap we've developed and we're continuing to develop reflects the scale of the challenge as well as the key focus areas we need for large, large scale decarbonization. Our technology roadmap document serves as a living document, I must say, and, and a guide for our investment portfolio. It identifies generally four broad focus areas shown here, which are fairly well aligned with the opportunity space that Oscar put forward. We're, we're, we're now in the process of refreshing our technology roadmap to incorporate the ever-changing context and the emerging technology prospects that can enable a pathway to net zero, including things like small modular nuclear reactors, for example. So just to give you a quick sense of the breadth and scale of our portfolio, we've now invested in a total of around 220 projects. Our total investment is on the order of $820 million or so. And one of the elements of our funding is that we always require at least one-to-one -one matching of our dollars with private dollars. We do this to ensure that there's a sufficient market demand or at least a market opportunity for the technologies we're supporting that can be supported by the private sector and by investors. And so far, we've been very successful over the years in leveraging our dollars. Um, the 221 projects we've 
invested in $820 million, $821 million, represent a total investment of around $6.6 billion. And these are Canadian dollars, by the way. Um, so we're helping to advance significant economic activity in the province. And just, just quickly before I move on to the example projects, uh, our investments are estimated to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 40 megatons in the province of Alberta on a CO2 equivalent basis by 2030. And an additional 80 megatons, we estimate based on subsequent market adoption of the technologies that we're supporting. So let's be clear, this isn't enough to get to net zero, we know that, but it's, a, it's starting to become a pretty strong technology foundation for us to build on. So I wanna share with you a, a handful of project examples from our portfolio of investments. And I, I just wanna focus on a couple of the areas that Oscar talked about as examples of really exciting activity that's happening in some of the areas we need to focus on to start moving toward net zero emissions. So the first examples shown on this slide are around low carbon hydrogen production. Oscar talked about the importance of hydrogen already, uh, but in summary, the allure or one of the allures of hydrogen for deep greenhouse gas reductions is that if the emissions can be dealt with at the point of hydrogen production, so either using renewable electricity and electrolysis or using natural gas reforming with carbon capture, you don't result in CO2 emissions with the end use or combustion of the hydrogen, which are much more distributed and harder to abate in things like vehicles, residential homes, and otherwise. So the first project shown here was, was publicly announced earlier this year, and, and this is a large scale net zero hydrogen energy complex being developed by air products. This first of kind facility will use autothermal reforming to produce hydrogen and capture the CO2 from the reforming process at a rate of about 95% and will feature a hydrogen fueled electricity generation power plant, which will, which will power the entire facility as well as export electricity to the grid uh, and offset emissions from the grid, um, covering the remaining 5% of emissions that, that aren't captured in the CO2 capture process. Uh, a portion of the hydrogen produced in this facility will be liquefied for an output of 30 tons per day of liquid hydrogen for hydrogen fueling opportunities. The captured CO2 will be injected into the Alberta carbon trunk line for permanent sequestration. So we awarded funding earlier this year and we're excited to see this project move, move forward toward construction and expected operation in 2024. The, the next two projects on this slide or in this list are both in process of being scale up from the lab scale and, or the bench scale up toward field testing stage. So these are much earlier in the development cycle. And these are, if you, we don't, I don't like to talk about the, the colors of hydrogen so much because it ends up being confusing, but these are neither really blue hydrogen or green hydrogen. I think some people call it turquoise hydrogen, um, but really the, the concept is decarbonizing the methane molecule without steam and without an exhaust gas that contains CO2. So rather when the hydrogen is separated from the carbon atoms, you end up with essentially pure hard hydrogen and a solid form of carbon in both of these cases. Um, the first one shown here, SWR Standing Wave Reformers is tackling this through what they call a wave rotor to, and what ultimately what this does is drives a thermal cracking process. Icona Power, on the other hand, um, very similar concept, but uses a what they call a pulsed methane pyrolysis process, which is again, a, a similar, but different thermally driven process. But in both cases, what you end up with is hydrogen and a solid carbon. Now, Icona Power, you see on the slide here, it talks about something called tri-generation um, pyrolysis or tri-generation. So what Icona Power is doing is they're developing a complementary technology, um, which, it, which uses a fuel cell to convert the solid carbon into electricity and a pure stream of CO2. So in the case of Icona, if all the carbon is used in the direct carbon fuel cell, you end up ultimately with three products, which is why they call it uh, tri-generation. You get hydrogen, you get electricity, and you get pure CO2 that can be sequesters. And so now I want to say just quickly, Oscar, I think talked about these pyrolysis type processes in one of his slides. And I think in parentheses, if I recall correctly, it talked about one of the barriers being the cost of it and expense. 
Um, and so the way that Econa looks at this in particular is if they can, within the tri generation process, if you can include the revenue in the electricity market, overall, it offsets the cost of hydrogen production in their anticipation to be quite competitive with steam methane reforming with carbon capture and storage attached, for example. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, I know time is tight. All right, the, the second set of examples I wanna to touch on is around the transport and use of hydrogen. So Oscar talked about both the, the, the supply side and the demand side. Um, producing hydrogen is all well and good, but if there's no market for it or no way to transport the hydrogen, then it ends up being an incomplete solution. So on the transportation side, we're, we're excited to be working with ATCO to demonstrate the blending of hydrogen into a natural gas network. Um, this project is demonstrating that hydrogen can be blended into a natural gas distribution system and used in customers' homes and appliances without requiring any hydrogen-specific infrastructure. Now, this is, this is different from delivering pure hydrogen to a pure hydrogen use case, but it is a critical demonstration of the ability to transport hydrogen using existing pipeline and end-use infrastructure, at least in some configuration. The, the next three projects here are all about using hydrogen for transportation processes. Uh, the Azatec project, which I, I'm, hopefully we've all heard of here, but which we funded through what we called our uh, best challenge, which was announced for funding in, in early 2019 uh, and is well underway, is a significant collaborative effort being led by the Alberta Motor Transport Association, who has partnered with a number of entities, including Ballard Power Systems for the fuel cell, uh, Dana for the electric drive system, Freightliner for the glider kit, um, HTEC for the refueling systems, as well as Clean Energy Solutions and the Transition Accelerator. This project will put two hydrogen powered ultra heavy duty trucks on the road in the Edmonton Calgary corridor with two more partners yet, um, Trimac and Bison, Tri Bison Transport, um, who will ultimately operate the trucks between Edmonton and Calgary. The, the City of Edmonton project here, which will involve hydrogen powered bus trials. And then the third one, the Canadian Pacific Railway project, which will involve hydrogen powered locomotives, were both announced earlier this week through and uh, awarded funding through ERA's Shovel Ready Challenge that was launched in late 2020. Um, I see someone, uh, Peter, I think, put posted a link uh, for the CP Rail project in the chat here. So, so thanks, Peter. Uh, certainly more information available on, on the website than what I can show on the slides here. Now, these two projects, I will say, are, are early, not early stage technology, but early in the development process for the projects. But we can say they're making great progress already. Um, these three are particularly powerful demonstrations for hydrogen use because they're for applications where the scale and the distance traveled and the payload requirements may not be well suited to battery powered electrification, which, which Oscar talked about already. And you know whether these end up being the long-term winners for heavy duty transport decarbonization, uh, these types of trials are, are absolutely critical data points in assessing the potential and the promise of these solutions. Uh, okay, so this is my second to last slide. Um, trying to not, not to make Petty, Perry and Eddie too nervous. Um, we, we could showcase our projects for hours upon hours, but the last set of examples I want to share is around transport electrification. So again, this is more on the demand side of the electricity file. And in the first two, in particular, combined with the hydrogen project I mentioned on the last slide, will provide us collectively with a really good comparison set of transit fleet decarbonization options. Um, even, you know, even these two alone, stripping away the, the hydrogen bus trial, these two electric bus projects are quite complementary to each other. The first comes from eCamion and in partnership with the city of Edmonton. And this will trial a novel power system for charge optimization at a central bus depot location. The concept here is more or less that the charging infrastructure stays in one location and the bus is returned to the depot for charging. And then the e camion system ensures that the right buses receive the right amount of charge at the right time so that they can proceed with their bus routes. Now, the second project from the city of Calgary, which both of these projects were actually, all, uh, yeah, both of these projects were also funded through our, our, our best challenge announced in 2019. But the second project from the city of Calgary will trial 
rapid charging stations along the bus routes. Now, I happen to think that these solutions together will provide a comprehensive solution that covers a wide range of use cases. Um, but even if I'm wrong, the, the data generated by these two projects will be a valuable showcase of the strengths of these different approaches. All the buses collecting together and charging at a depot or having a number of different rapid charging stations along the busing routes as in the, the city of Calgary case. Now we, we have a number of other electrification on the demand side, as well as electricity generation projects on the supply side in our portfolio. Um, so this includes, for example, an e-fleet pilot in partnership with NMAX Power, uh, a number of renewable electricity projects, energy storage projects, um, and even some related to transmission and distribution systems. In fact, this is a bit of a shameless plug, but we just launched a new episode of our podcast this morning, which features Transalta's Wind Charger Project, a battery storage installation at Transalta's Summerview Wind Farm near Pincher Creek. Uh, our next episode will feature long duration storage. Oscar talked about the need for long duration storage uh, technology. And our, our podcast is called Carbon Copy. You can get it on almost all podcast platforms, but not Spotify for some reason. I'm still planning to look into that. Now, in summary though, as Oscar said, electrification and low carbon electricity will both be key pillars in Alberta's roadmap to net zero. Okay, so this is my, my final slide, Eddie, I, I promise. Um, I wanna leave everyone with a couple final thoughts around the role for technology and the need for complete solutions in order to tackle climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. And if I may, I'm gonna use the COVID-19 pandemic just like Eddie did as a bit of a case study, building on what Eddie said in his introduction. So in fact, before COVID-19 came along, it was clear that climate change was the defining global issue of our time. And I, I say it will continue to be the most challenging issue we face as a global society, but COVID-19 has emerged and has dominated the public discourse over the last two years and has become an issue of greater urgency and acuteness compared to climate change. So my hope is that we can carry forward some of what we learned in dealing with COVID-19 into our efforts to combat climate change. The world's response to COVID-19 has been a powerful reminder of the need for aligned action, trusted leadership and robust systems in the face of a global challenge. Technology and innovation have been applied at almost every facet from food services to vaccines, to finding new ways to host meetings and conferences just like this. For example, developing and approving a vaccine in less than a year was previously unheard of. But even with that, technology by itself was not enough to bend the curve on COVID-19 health impacts, economic impacts, and sadly, lives lost, the world needed to create new vaccines, needed to de-risk and scale up production of those vaccines, needed to unlock financing for vaccine research and development, needed to create new supply chains, implement adapt adaptive policies, assemble the right people, and finally build public confidence, which in some pockets of the world has been one of the greatest challenges in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic. As Eddie said, uh, technology alone is not a panacea. And the same applies to climate change, even more so I would say, because we need a broad suite of transformative technologies. Now complete solutions are what we need to tackle climate change, including technology, financing, policy, people, and public confidence. And this also comes in the face of competing ideologies and competing information. And then the second last, the second lesson and my final message is a more hopeful one. And just like Oscar, I wanna end on a positive note. COVID-19 has also taught us that the world is indeed capable of coordinated action and rapid technological advancements in the time of a crisis. The projects we have the opportunity to support at ERA in our portfolio are just the tip of the iceberg and a hopeful sign that complete solutions can and will emerge. Well, Mark, uh, I'll say wow. Uh, it's really impressive to see how you, in Alberta, we have such a showcase of technology uh, for hydrogen, especially, 
uh, both the production, the marketing, the distribution, um, all intended for heating and transportation. The charging station in Calgary, also very impressive. Um, I think that uh, the rest of Canada just does not know what is happening in Alberta. That is so, so very impressive. And thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I think it's uh, been a great uh, three presentations that we've heard from our speakers. Uh, Oscar Sigvaldson, Axel Meissen, and Mark Summers. I'm going to turn things over to Perry for the uh, concluding session, which is really to answer any questions that have emerged. Perry, over to you. Well, thank you, Eddie, and thank you all. Um, I'll conclude with thank yous uh, as we wrap this up but beforehand. Um, I've checked the chat and I, I see, Bill, you had a question uh, of uh, Mark regarding the actual uh, pr practice and experimentation of the usage of hydrogen. Bill, do you want to pose your question? There have been quite a few uh, hydrogen vehicle, either fuel cell or, or uh, other transport system demonstration projects over the decades uh, throughout the world. But is there some, uh, are there special aspects to, to the Alberta program? Some or is actually the main emphasis on trying to familiarize people that will have to deal with these systems on the long term? You're absolutely right. Hydrogen bus trials have been done before. I think most people are aware that there were hydrogen fuel cell buses at the Vancouver Olympics, but because of the purity of hydrogen required, they had to truck hydrogen across the country from, from Ontario or Quebec, where it was produced with electrolysis. And and so it's a little bit of both. I mean, now in 2021, the technology around fuel cells, around um, drivetrains, around hydrogen storage has, has evolved. And so it, it's partly a demonstration of uh, the, the latest and greatest innovative technology, but it's also exactly what you said around incorporating into Alberta, incorporating to the systems of Alberta, into the psyche of Alberta, um, as well as testing with the, the local supply of hydrogen in Alberta um, from a feedstock perspective, purity pers perspective, and a systems perspective. So as a, a brief answer, we can certainly talk a little bit more offline, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's both, and it kind of plays into that message around complete solutions. Uh, we need to see complete solutions, um, regulatory policy, um, know-how, and uh, public acceptance if we want to be able to move this forward in, in really any jurisdiction around the world. Thank you, Mark uh, and Bill, for your question. Uh, Axel, I've got one for you. Uh, you may be understating the, uh, the public acceptance of nuclear, and in, in the case the point being made that we're seeing more and more announcements of nuclear, and I mean nuclear in the broad sense as we know it now, uh, France taking up more, more sites, uh, China's moving in that direction. It, it seems to me that the social license for nuclear is in fact being revitalized. It's hard to tell. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, Western Europe, it's quite divided. Uh, I think public opinion and in Germany, for example, and even governmental opinion in Germany is not certainly not pro-nuclear. Uh, in France, we see the government continuing to be in favor of, of, of nuclear. So I think there are still significant divisions about uh, uh, nuclear. And when I, I use the term nuclear, it's primarily focused on fission because fusion really hasn't penetrated the public awareness to uh, uh, to a very large extent. As you know, yes. I'm seeing announcements almost weekly of whether it be what's going on in England, what's happening in China, uh, what happened in Finland. Um, every It seems every week there's some news story coming out. Well, that wasn't the case a year ago. Whether that represents a fundamental change, uh, I, I hope it, it, it represents a much more open mind to looking at issues associated uh, with nuclear, including risks. Uh, I mean, there are risks. Uh, if you look at uh, the risk associated with nuclear fission, uh, I think the safety record is remarkably good, uh, notwithstanding that there were some near, uh, near misses. And that's what my table tried, tried to show. Okay, super. Uh, Oscar, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up the Q&A with a question for you. 
globalization itself seems to have brought science to the fore as either a new religion or something to hate. Um, what, what role do, does diplomacy and government really play in bringing these forwards? It, it seems to me, and I'm going to tell personally, the government plays, is, seems to be playing more of a role of disrupting and impeding the emergence of, of new technologies than in fact expediting. And yet we talk about leadership and innovation being a, a fundamental platform to have an economy in the new world. And yet, well, why don't you weigh in on the social politics of, uh, of climate change, the social politics of technology diffusion? This is a very, uh, I think this is a very important question. And uh, there's a group of us who have been uh, kind of uh, frustrated with the amount of misinformation that is out there. Um, there are very strong lobby groups uh, by so-called experts who are really delivering the wrong message, um, but uh, invariably from, from a very polarized point of view. Um, so uh, I try to mention that in the last slide that uh, that there's a lack there's a lack of understanding that uh, when you talk about uh, decarbonizing in many people's minds, and this has been accentuated by a lot of political rhetoric that basically says that de uh, decarbonizing means getting rid of the fossil fuel industry. And, uh, and that's where the misinformation starts. And there's a lot of um, experts out there who are basically reinforcing that message in, in some institutions and so on. So I think the uh, a lot of this really arises from the fact that uh, there's a lack of comprehensive integrated planning. People are coming at this from a from a you know, particular position, whether it's an environmental position or or a, a technology position, and so on. But what is really required is really to uh, get uh, a fully integrated story together that shows that. As you uh, transform the energy system, this doesn't mean that a particular sector somehow suddenly vanishes. So I try to bring that out in the sense that uh, that uh, we need to redefine what is the hydrocarbon at net zero. It will still be hugely important. It will have important roles. It will be a, still an important part of the uh, uh, production of uh, of electricity because in many cases there aren't any options and uh, but it's going to have to require CCS and so on. But the, the core of your question is really critically important and somehow we do need to say how do we get the right story out there about the role of the hydrocarbon sector in a decarbonized uh, net zero environment. So this is a huge challenge. I think all of us have to work together on that. And uh, we have to get the messaging around it. We have to emphasize the importance of comprehensive integrated planning and to see what a net zero future actually looks like, including what the hydrocarbon sector will look like for a net zero future. Eric Newell had a question. Go ahead, Eric. Um, My question, um, Eddie, it first starts from a, a discussion yesterday between a friend of David Parker's is on our first uh, webinar and Axel Meissen's comment coming back. Axel, you, you gave some really good perspective uh, for me in particular about the model, the Stream 3 MMR high temperature model that would really fit well with the oil sands. But you also indicated that if that's going to really move ahead, it's probably going to be need to be driven by Alberta and Saskatchewan. And uh, and so now I come back to my really good friend, Mark, who I worked with on the, the original uh, era thing. And Mark, you mentioned, and, and I understand this, but we don't have uh, nuclear projects in our tier portfolio. And so uh, I'm not asking necessarily to solve it on this one, but to me, uh, we got to somehow, we got this great pilot project that's going to be starting up in Chalk River and 20 uh, and 2028, I think, Axel, and uh, and it's the one would ideally fit in with what we're doing in the oil sands, you know, uh, for, 
going back there. And so somehow we got to get Alberta Innovates. And when I say that, I mean you really, uh, Ira. Somehow we got to get it connected to how can we move that opportunity forward? So maybe I'll leave it rather than as a question to, for you guys to try to pont pontificate on is uh, leave it as a bit of a challenge to figure out what do we have to do to get it going? Because, um, you know, Axel raised the other very good point. Uh, you know, in the industry, uh, oil sense, for example, if it, the pilot plants out there in 28, you're not going to even be thinking of commercializing anything till, you know, 2030. But that, but really, that's not that far away. And and we've got to start getting something going on the ground. And I apologize. I I it's my 77th birthday, and my kids are throwing a party, and I got to leave. Happy okay. Birthday. So happy birthday, birthday Eric. Uh, very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, do you want to pick up on any comments that Eric made there? Sure, I'll, I, I'll be very brief. And the only thing I'll say is that um, Steve and I, Steve McDonald, our CEO and myself, we were at the World Petroleum Congress last week in Houston. And there was one of the, the technical sessions involved uh, um, someone from Suncor Energy, as well as a, a panelist talking about the, the, the suite of small modular nuclear reactor technology coming forward, some of which Axel talked about, um, some of which were, were maybe a little bit more, more nuanced. And, and, and so the quick answer for me is, I mean, the philosophy of ERA, is, as you very well know, is that there has to be some demand in the marketplace. And it, and it looks like the all sense operators are starting to get very interested in, and, and that the suite of technologies available with the range of um, steam temperature and pressure offerings coming out of the, the reactor is starting to look quite uh, potentially promising for the oil sands uh, sector. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and say, it looks like momentum is going in the right direction. Thank okay, you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. And uh, you know, a couple of concluding comments or observations, if you will. Uh, if the general public were, were observing this session or our predecessor, one of the things that should be obvious to the general public is the world is paying attention to Alberta. I mean, we, we may be a population that's small, but we are having an enormous impact and whether or not it's viewed as negative, which it typically has been, or whether it's to be viewed as positive is up to us. Uh, with globalization, it was Bill Clinton, I think, that made the point when he visited some years ago, you're, you are on the world stage, like it or not, with what you have with the oil sands, which is increasingly known worldwide and producing 5% of the daily production of oil in the world, um, we, are vic we are potentially victims. And I think we're feeling it with some of the pressure that goes on worldwide. So it's critically important that Alberta get its message out. Um, over the last 15 years, my predecessor, the Alberta Council of Technologies and, and KEI through these webinars is, is making a point. And, and, it, and it was threefold. It, if Alberta is going to have a sustainable economy, we're going to make the impact, which we can potentially make that one. We've got to make the energy transition, which is well underway. And it's, it's not something that we're being forced into. It's something which I'm hearing over and over again, whether it be Eddie or Eric, uh, Oscar or, or, or Mark. We, we are making changes, we are adjusting, and we, get, we need to get that message out that we're not fighting for the status quo. We're fighting to accept a reality and, and, and we are prepared to make a difference. The second point that was made is leadership and innovation. And that's what I hear Mark saying, there's plenty going on in the province of Alberta. And, and it's not surprising because of the pressure that we're under that we're gonna adapt and we're gonna make and, and lead in innovation. But that means getting rid of some of the, the red tape and the bureaucracies and the institutions that advocate for status quo. And then the final one is often been articulated as preparing our workforce for the future. And I, I, I wanna modify that some way, what, given what Oscar just had to say. I, I think we've gotta prepare our public for the future. The changes that are underway are potentially disruptive, whether it be climate change where we're a victim yeah or emerging technologies where we take charge again. Uh, we need a public to be on side in a democracy and we've got to do a better job of communicating, not about its complexity, but get our messages simple that the public can understand. So gentlemen, thank you for helping in that regard today. Eddie, in particular, your excellent moderation and preparing the panel for, the, for today, Oscar. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for your overview. Uh, Axel, always insightful. And I love the nuclear story, as you know. Thank you for joining yeah. us, Helen, by the way. Uh, and Mark, um, I think we're in good hands.